Hi everyone, my name is Randolph, and here today I am with Zeus, the carpet python, and today I'm going to do a video on just the general care of carpet pythons if you keep them in captivity. Now, there are multiple species of carpet pythons and subspecies you can find in Australia where they're native from, but we're just going to go over the general overview of carpet pythons in captivity and how to take care of them. Now with carpet pythons, they are more of an intermediate species. They take a little bit more care and investment. <laughs> Even this little one is definitely a handful working with them. Now Zeus comes from Via Aquarium and he's one of our animal ambassadors and he's used for live hands-on education programs with reptiles and invertebrates. Now carpet pythons keeping them as pets, of course, just like with any animal needs care. But these need a little bit more experience handling larger reptiles. They do get quite big for their size, and they need a lot of space to move around. Now, if you are thinking about a carpet python, and you already have at least five years of experience taking care of larger snakes and other challenging reptiles, then this will be a better reptile for you. In this video, we're going to go over some things. We're going to go over enclosure heat and humidity, feedings, health, handling. Now with enclosures, uh, carpet pythons need a lot of space. Now Zeus is a male carpet python, and males will usually get about six feet at max, and a female can get about eight to nine feet. Now with either male or female, they like to use up a lot of space. Now in Australia, there are semi-arboreal species of python, so they spend most of their time up in trees or naturally you can find them in urban neighborhoods so you can find carpet pythons on telephone poles, people's <laughs> rooftops. Those are their hunting areas. And then later on in the video, we'll talk about the feeding and how that vertical space can help them with their hunting behavior. Now for an enclosure, you can either do a very tall tub, which is you probably have to get something custom made like a PVC enclosure, or you can get a custom wooden enclosure. You can also do a very tall tank. Now with the dimensions, like for Zeus here, and he's disappearing right <laughs> behind my head because he's so adventurous. It's in the evening, so of course he wants to move around as I'm talking because this is what carpet pythons do. Now, the dimensions of his enclosure, we made him a nice custom-made enclosure that houses him and another cool animal. Maybe you get to see in another video. And his enclosure is about four feet high by four feet wide by two and a half feet in depth. So that, you know, if you see the enclosure, it looks like a tiny snake in this big enclosure. You're like, why are you going to spend all that money and investment? Well, for him, it gives him enough space to move around, and he has a vertical enclosure. Now, if he was horizontal, he can go, of course, going long, but he likes to be up high. So, even with his temperature and humidity, that plays a part in where he's going to start to level himself throughout the day. And that's what carpet pythons do in the wild. They might have a higher spot in a tree where they can bask and warm up for the day. And then once the temperature gets a little too hot, they just kind of climb down and cool down in another shaded area. With snakes, most of them don't need UVB, so that helps you out with the enclosure, so you don't have to necessarily worry about that. But if you want to put in some LED lights or some fixtures, it doesn't hurt. But I just use natural room light, and it kind of creates a shading just like in the wild, so it makes them a little bit more comfortable. Even right now, even with all the lights going on, he's adventurous right now. It's towards the end of the day where carpet pythons are a little bit more active. Thanks. Pretty cool, and now he's hanging on my glasses. <laughs> Heating and humidity in the enclosure. So there's a couple instruments that you can use to help with that. So we have here today, we have a temperature heat gun, and this can help you test the temperature on the substrate, so where his hot spot is, where he's going to be climbing up to warm and bask during the day or at night. This is a great instrument to use. We also have a humidity gauge and thermometer. And you can also use this as well, and you can install this inside the enclosure with the carpet python. So if you just want to get an idea, and it's digital, I like these a little bit better compared to the ones, the little old school ones where you kind of just see the dial and it just moves up. It's a little bit more accurate. And then I've been using this instrument a little bit more often. I just found about it maybe several months ago. And this is a humidity meter and also tests 
the temperature and the heat uh, on the air around the enclosure. So you can just stick this instrument in and you can test the humidity out and also get the air temperature. Uh, it's a good instrument to have around uh, when you're keeping, a, especially a snake in a larger enclosure. There's going to be those microclimates, which is going to be important for the animal to uh, have a comfortable uh, life cycle. So you want to make sure that they're not just all the time hot, neither all the time cold. Especially in a vertical enclosure, uh, it's not the typical enclosure most people keep animals. Uh, usually you do a horizontal enclosure. Uh, but with carpet pythons, since they're semi-arboreal, they spend most of their time uh, in the wild, uh, up in trees, uh, basking during the day and hunting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later with the feeding, how having that nice vertical enclosure is going to cause a natural feeding behavior with your carpet python, which is really cool. And with the humidity, how to keep the humidity up, uh, some people would say carpet pythons need a humidity over 60% since they come from the east coast of Australia and they're found near jungles and forests. Uh, people think it gets super saturated, but actually Australia goes through seasons uh, just like us. Actually, they're the opposite of us right now. So Australia is in autumn, which means it's a little bit cooler and damp compared to our winter is their summer. So if you can play around uh, in a comfortable, not stress out the animal, but keep the animal comfortable in a fluctuation of heat and humidity. It's going to help them uh, be active during certain times of the day and also uh, interest him in his feeding behavior uh, during the times where he's going to be hunting out. Like right now, it's towards the end of the day, it's evening. Carp pythons will be a little bit more exploring at night. They could be nocturnal and they'll just be hunting around catching prey. Now with the vertical enclosures, since you already have it set up, uh, you want to make sure that since they're, like I was saying, up in trees, they're not really going to get their heat source under them. Uh, unless you're keeping a baby carpet python in a, a Tupperware bin, uh, then you want to slowly, gradually move them up when they're getting towards juvenile or adults to get heating right above them. So just like out in the sun, you want to keep the heat fixture. Uh, I have a 100-watt uh, ceramic heater that's left on for 24 hours a day. Uh, with UVB, it's not necessary for most snakes. So the lighting I'm going to get, I just kind of turn on the lights, uh, leave on for 12 hours a day, so he gets that day cycle just naturally coming in. And it's a little bit darker in there, so it's just like if he was in the, the branches of a tree and moving around and exploring, it's just a little bit more dim, just like a forest where he's not going to have all that brightness. Even though right now he's active and he just wants to move around around my neck and knock stuff off the table, this is comfortable for him. And they especially have larger eyes, so you don't have to go crazy on the lighting because they can be a little bit sensitive since they have larger eyes for hunting at night. Don't want to overdo it. With the humidity, uh, how you can keep that up, I keep my humidity between 40% to 60%. So throughout the months or throughout the year, the humidity is going to fluctuate just like out in the wild. So he has that option if he wants to start to shed. If he wants a higher humidity, uh, he can find another spot that's a little bit cooler and it will help him with his natural shed. Or if he wants a little bit drier, uh, humidity kind of dries up a little bit on one corner of the enclosure where he can kind of hang out there. So the substrate I use is a mix. I like to call it the jungle mix, which is just, <laughs> he's like grabbing over the the table and stuff. So it was a jungle mix of mulch, uh, sphagnum moss, and sphagnum peat moss. And that's going to help you out uh, keeping that humidity up. And also, you can mist it, get a good mist in there. I do it at least once or twice a day. If I do a light misting, I do it twice a day. If I do a heavy misting, I only do it once a day. And once it's really moist but not saturated, that is dripping out, then that's a good humidity. And I have a humidity gauge in there. So I get an idea, and I also use this instrument. I just test the air humidity. Also, being in an aquarium, working here, uh, open water tanks all the time, a lot of evaporation. The humidity is perfect for a jungle species because you don't have to worry about getting too dry in here. It's always moist, which is cool. Feeding, which is probably going to be the coolest thing, and the most rewarding thing you're going to do with a carpet python. Now, being semi-arboreal, they're not going to be grabbing their prey and dropping it to the ground like some prayers, like a big cat. These guys are going to be doing all their business and they're pretty much their whole life is just going to be up high. And with carpet pythons, what they do, they actually will grab their prey, constrict it, and they'll hang it upside down. They'll eat their food upside down as well. 
They have long teeth, which are gnarly, <laughs> and they will catch small birds, marsupials, rodents, reptiles, maybe a snake if they're desperately hungry. Carpet pythons are not picky eaters, just like king snakes, and they will never turn down a meal. For captive bred snakes, I always say do frozen thawed, it's safer. It also reduces the chances of anything zoonic or parasitic coming from the live prey they're eating. And I'll show you in a quick video how to do that. It's going to be in this clip as I merge it in during the editing. carpet pythons. It is important because Zeus is almost six feet long and a snake when they strike out can reach about half their body length so he has about a good two and a half three foot reach when I'm feeding him. So I use snake tongs or just any reptile tongs and they are almost as long as his head and neck that I want to keep myself safe. This is just an extension of me when I'm feeding the animal. Of course, you'll see in videos people hand feeding snakes. I would not do that for most snakes, unless it's like a tiny little garter snake. But in general, you want to play it safe and be professional about when you're feeding your animals. You also don't want to mistaking them for your hand for food. If you look close, it's kind of hard to see in the video, covered pythons have huge heat pits going along their lip and the bottom of their jaw. And that is an indication as they evolve, having a large heat pit, that they're going to hang their head down off a tree branch or on a rooftop where you see them, sometimes during houses, that they're going to keep their head down and they're going to pretend to be a vine. And then once anything flies over, they're going to strike down, grab it, and they're going to sense that heat coming off the body of that animal. When you're feeding them frozen thawed, you kind of want to heat up the food warmer than you. So your body temperature is around 97, 98 degrees. I try to keep that food... <laughs> like 90, 90 to 100 degrees when I thaw it out and warm it up a bit. I want him to get an exact location, a pinpoint where that food is coming from. And this is an animal you don't want him to stick in your hand and grab it for food. It's not going to be a pleasant bite. But other than that, it is very cool to watch. Uh, carpet pythons, they just hang, he kind of hangs just right over the food and just slowly uncoils it and then just hangs it by his head and just starts swallowing it down which is awesome to watch. Now you can give them different prey items. Uh, kind of depends on financially uh, what is available in the market. Uh, the easiest one is just to feed when they're babies, pinky mice, and then get to larger mice. And then when they're adults, just feed them rats. And that's about it. But if you want to give them options, which is great for enrichment for the snake, you can also give them small birds. Uh, you can give them like young chickens, not a full grown chicken, of course. And then small, like quail, so like button quail would be a good source to feed your snake. It's a small option. You want to give them food about the width of their body because they're going to stretch out their bottom jaws and separate the food, but you don't want to overdo it and make the animal sick or stress out and hurt themselves with food. The last part of this video, we're going to talk about the health and handling of your carpet python. Now with carpet pythons, they can get sick. It's natural. They do have a good lifespan, so they're hardy animals in captivity. They can live about 20 to 25 years, and sometimes they can live maybe close to 30 years if their husbandry is spot on. So, very rewarding animal to keep, and very just interesting with the pattern and color of this creature. Now, with health issues, I always tell people, even myself, go to a vet. That is the most important thing you can do. Find a vet in your area. Uh, you can also, sometimes it kind of sucks where you live and you have to find a vet and look around for someone that specializes in snakes or exotic animals or reptiles in general. <laughs> now, snakes can get, since I was talking about humidity, uh, you, being too high or very, very too low, almost dry in the desert, it can cause stuff like respiratory infection or dry or stuck shed, and that can cause health problems with your animal. If you notice anything bizarre or off with your animal, uh, just mark it down and note it. And so when you go to the vet, uh, you can just let them know 
about what's going on with your snake or any exotic animal you have, and it just gives them a better picture of how can they help your animal. What I like to do with all the animals I have here uh, at the education shows, they, everyone has an intake sheet. So each of them has a sheet where I just log down their feeding, especially for snake, you want to keep track of the routine of how often they're eating. You don't want to overfeed them, like feed them once a week or every few days, especially when they're adults, because they make them overweight and fat. But also you don't want to underfeed your snake by feeding them uh, once every two months. That's be a little bit bad, but of course there's other factors that play into why a snake may not be eating, not just could be just sick, it also could be just the time of the year or bur brumation, I always mess up that word, brumation, can also play a part with uh, some reptiles with their feeding, but either way, you want to track it down, log it in, uh, I do Excel worksheet and track down every feeding, anything that looks off of the snake, also sometimes their fecal, uh, if I did collect a fecal sample to test it for parasites or anything microbial, uh, just to do a routine check on that. It's great to just mark it down, so if I have to bring them to the vet or if I have to do any treatment, at least I have an idea uh, what was going on for that period of time that can cause issues with the snake. Now with handling, as you can see, uh, some people have a bad misconception that you should not be <laughs> playing around with a carpet python like this. Uh, with him, a lot of handling uh, has gone into getting Zeus to be inquisitive and in being in thinking mode what he's doing right now he's trying to like think he can stretch over and climb over the camera right now but i'm trying to keep him over here even right now he's not squeezing my neck he's just holding on to me he thinks i'm just an extension of a tree branch and i'm a nice warm object that he can move around on and he's not nervous at all he's just in thinking mode and he just wants to explore and look around in his environment but with younger carpet pythons they can be defensive i'm not going to say uh, to attacking or trying to bite you. Since when they're tiny, they come out these little guys almost a foot long, everything's going to eat them. And a natural instinct to response, they're not domesticated animals, even though they're captive bred. They have that instinct to think that anything that's larger than them, which I am, could be potentially a predator, that they think I might be able to eat them. And I almost forgot about something which is going to play a part of how the comfortability and handling with your snake. Have a front open door, a sliding door enclosure, Try not to go above your snake, and that can mimic a bird of prey, which would be snacking on carpet pythons or a large marsupial or another large reptile that might try to eat a carpet python. And once they're adults, they gain that little more of that confidence, and they can start to you get a little more of a personality of that animal, or you notice new things about their behavior, like this, just handling them. And maybe in another video, I'll talk about just the work on getting conditioning with your reptile. In captivity and can't forget like I was just showing with the feeding a snake hook even though Zeus is like a puppy dog and I can cuddle with him and stuff like that he doesn't want to give me a kiss he's just anti-social you know time of the year so having a snake hook even though this snake hook is a little bit small for him it's, he's gotten bigger over time since being here so having a nice size snake hook depending on the width of your snake it's good to have. It's a great tool to have uh, just to get the animal knowing that, uh, hey, you're not food. It's just something touching me. You can move around your animal safely, and you don't have to worry about your hands being chewed up with these long teeth inside his mouth. But, of course, usually snakes, when they do bite you, either they're mistaking you for food or it's defense. Uh, they're just trying to protect themselves. Once in a while, Zeus will get a little bit touchy, and I just respect the animal's space and give him time to adjust, and sometimes I'll just rub the snake hook along his body just to let him know that I'm not going to hurt him and everything's going to be okay. I'm going to end this video here with Zeus, and I just want to thank everyone for watching this video. Now you can like and subscribe the channel and see for any updates on any care videos or anything. I'm still trying to work this out with videos about animals at Via Aquarium or some animals I might see elsewhere. So. Working on new content, getting used to this YouTube thing. If you want to check out Zeus and other terrestrial animals at the aquarium, or even, of course, it's an aquarium, check out the fish as well. I'm going to put a link in the description down below, and you can check out the aquarium on their Facebook and website. And hopefully we get to see people soon after this pandemic. And 
check out all the cool animals here at the uh, aquarium. Now, also, I almost forgot another thing. I'm just doing this video on the whim. I'm going to have a care sheet on carpet pythons on my Instagram page, and I'm going to list my Instagram profile so you can check it out. And I'm just going to go over the basic overview of what I just talked up today, except I didn't add enclosures because the enclosures, depending on the size of your snake, is going to vary. But it's going to go over the overview of what you should expect on the care of a carpet python. Like I was saying, this is not a beginner species, and if you have experience with carbon pythons and you have invested and put your research in, then this could be a good reptile for you. So I'm going to leave off right here with Zeus. Take care, guys.